I want to talk about daily practice for scientific thinking and really a scientific thinking culture in the organization. It's about a way of working and maybe even more interestingly, a way of working together. I think that's very important these days. Uh, number two, I think of scientific thinking as an ingredient that makes some teams and organizations especially effective. And I'd like to talk about that a little bit more. It sounds kind of big, scientific thinking. Uh, it's not the scientific method, it's scientific thinking. And I'd, I'd like to convey that a little bit. It's something really anyone can do. And finally, it's an aspect of culture. There's that word everybody's talking about. It's an aspect of culture that you can create through practice. People talk about culture change. I don't use that word so much anymore because I don't know if that's even possible. Um, and there are lots of things about your culture that may be good. So I like to talk about culture modification. And I think that is something you can do. And I think it's something you can do through practice. And I think it's something you can do through deliberate practice. But before we get going, I'd like to talk a little bit about Mr. Percival Lowell. And Lowell was a businessman and an astronomer. He founded the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona in the 1890s. He spent several years viewing and sketching these networks of lines, that's one of his sketches there, networks of lines that he observed on Mars and Venus. He argued that the lines were canals built by some kind of intelligent civilization to move water supplies around. He also noted that whenever he looked at these planets, the canals or the lines were in the same position, so he hypothesized, he thought that these planets must be in synchronous rotation around the sun. Uh, in 2003, uh, a retired optometrist, optometrist figured out what Percival Lowell was actually seeing. So to reduce glare on his telescope, which you see there, he, he shut the aperture on the outside end of his telescope down to three inches to reduce the glare from the bright planets. And uh, when you narrow the aperture down that much on the outside edge, the telescope starts to mimic a different kind of instrument called an ophthalmoscope, which is an instrument to examine the interior of the eye. The lines Lowell was interpreting as canals were actually shadows of the blood vessels in his own retina. <laughs> in other words, his maps of Venus and Mars are actually a map of the back of his eyeball, which is what you see on the left-hand side there. Right? In 1965, the Mariner 4 spacecraft finally proved there are no canals on Mars. So a lesson from this story for us is that just because you think something doesn't make it a fact. And you may have seen the bumper sticker, don't believe everything you think. That's a scientific attitude. And that's a good cue up for talking about Toyota Kata and scientific thinking. So we studied Toyota, uh, Toyota's management system. We studied Toyota for a long time. We were just talking about Jeff Liker uh, and, and, and all the years of study. Um, but really from 2003 to 2009, we studied Toyota's management approach. We, you know, we, we went back. We went back because we knew something was missing. Uh, Jim Womack was saying, you know, I think it's in their management system, but that's all we knew. Uh, there was the idea that Toyota managers tend not to tell people what to do. They tend to ask questions. We tried that, so we said to the manager, you can't tell your people what to do, you can only ask questions, and the manager would say, okay, well I have the solution that I want in my head, but I can't say it, so I want my employees to guess. Please, like, you know, guess the number I'm thinking kind of thing. <laughs> um, which didn't work, of course, that wasn't really... Uh... Here's what we found. There is this visible stuff that we benchmarked and tried to replicate for so long. Toyota's results are astonishing, which is why you study Toyota in the first place. Uh, so many years of profitability, that does catch your attention. Uh, but also all those lean tools and practices that most of you are probably familiar with. When we went back, after you look long enough, you see the less visible stuff. And I've got two points here. One is a systematic scientific way of thinking and acting. And number two, that the managers are kind of the teachers or the coaches teaching their people that way of thinking. And what's interesting is that the visible stuff on top kind of rests on the bottom stuff, which is the foundation for making the stuff on the top work. And if you see it that way, which one of these would you rather copy? Their solutions, their tools, or their way of developing solutions and their, their way of thinking and acting? Uh, obviously, I think uh, the bottom part is the smarter thing to copy. So what it is, what it turns out to be, if you will, is navigating with a compass uh, instead of a map. So if you navigate with a map, 
you know, you've decided how you're going to get where you're going. Whereas if you're navigating with a compass, you know where you want to get, you know the direction, but you have no idea exactly how you're going to get there, and you're going to have to figure out along the way. So scientific thinking is like that, is like navigating with a compass. Uh, and it may be the best means we currently have for navigating through complex, dynamic, unpredictable territory toward challenging goals. I mean, everybody talks about that these days, right? It's very difficult to predict. Marketplace is difficult, it's much more complex than it used to be. Uh, things are changing all the time. There's an interesting kind of side thought to that. You can establish challenging goals for an organization if the people in the organization have practiced and learned an effective way of meeting those goals. In other words, just giving people autonomy doesn't automatically mean that they're going to make good decisions. There's a little bit more to it. So uh, if you will, scientific thinking as a prerequisite for empowerment. I think what Toyota is able to do is generate and utilize a kind of entrepreneurial mindset and behavior in its people, even as a mature company. It's a large company. It's a conservative company. What do I mean by entrepreneurial spirit? Number one, not assuming the current situation is permanent. Able to welcome a challenge even though the answers are unknown. I don't think people inside Toyota are going, yay, yes, another challenge, another unknown. They're human beings just like us. But they're a little more able to take on a challenge as opposed to pushing it off and saying, no, let's just keep doing what we've always been doing. Number two, being OK with some uncertainty. Right? Able to move forward even though you don't know exactly how you're going to get to where you're going. It's that navigating with a compass. So it's a, it's a bit of a hallmark of uh, entrepreneurial mindset. And finally, viewing barriers more as obstacles. In other words, a barrier is not a reason not to do something, but it's like, oh, OK, hmm, we're going to have to figure out how to break through that. Again, it's not all perfect at Toyota, but they are able to somehow maintain this spirit to some degree, which gives some dynamism to the organization. And I do think it's the managers who are doing that. If you look long enough, this is the way they tend to think and act. It's kind of a four-step process, first one being understanding the larger goal or direction, get the direction or challenge. What are we trying to get to more in the six month, one year, two year time frame? Where are we trying to go in the long range? Uh, second step is to grasp the current condition. You see it down in the lower left hand corner. There's a long tradition at Toyota of go and see, go look again. This is the step we all like to jump over. We want to get right into action. And this is the one where your Toyota mentor holds your feet to the fire and says, I don't think you understand well enough. You need to go look again. The whole go and see or go to Gemba uh, or those stories about the Ono circle, for those of you who like those stories, um, I think that's kind of that step two, grasp the current condition. Once you have a direction and you know where you are now, that puts you into position to take the third step, which is to establish a goal or a target condition that's on the way to your challenge but much closer in. One week in the future, two weeks in the future, a month in the future, much easier to define, still difficult to achieve, but much more easy to imagine, right? It was funny, we don't call it target, right? We call it target condition. Um, we were following some uh, Japanese uh, Toyota managers around as they worked with a US supplier, and they would ask the American, you know, at, at, the, at the process, they'd say, what is target, right? And uh, people would say, like we did, 10% oh, cost savings, or usually a number, some kind of number. And the Toyota guys would go, no, 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 what is target? And, and there was this miscommunication and some frustration going on, and we couldn't figure it out. And after a while, we asked them, and we said, are you asking how should this process be functioning so that the target is achieved? Yes, 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 exactly. So it's easy to set a target. It's much more difficult to understand your process and say, OK, if we want 10% less, I predict that the process is going to have to look like this. And now that gives you something to work toward. And later, we even heard that the Japanese word that they were thinking of is more like target condition. So you not only describe the number, but you describe what the situation looks like that will generate that outcome that you want, which again requires a depth of understanding that is much harder than to say, yeah, we want 10%. That's, that's easy. Anyone can do that. So, uh, and then finally, step four, uh, they tend to work kind of scientifically, conduct experiments to get there. Let's talk about scientific thinking. And you should have a card on your uh, table in front of you that looks like this. Everybody grab your card if you can. And we have extra ones, I believe, in the back. So if someone doesn't have a card, just let us know and we'll get you one. 
Um, and please turn the card to the side uh, that doesn't have the line on it, that looks like the, the one on the screen, and put the dot on the left. Some of you may have done this. What I'd like you to do is hold the card in front of your nose, maybe a foot and a half away, 30 centimeters, and uh, close your left eye, close the left eye, stare at the dot with your right eye, and slowly move the card inward and outward until something happens. What happens? What happens? The cross disappears, right? Okay, cool. That's what's supposed to happen. Why does this happen? Why does the cross disappear? It's what? Myopia. Myopia? <laughs> we'll get to that. Um, yeah, why does it disappear? By the way, it doesn't work for everyone for some physiological reason. If it's not working for you, you have to leave. There are consolation prizes. <laughs> No problem. It's going to be a lot of extra food today. <laughs> Why does it happen? It's your blind spot. Right. So as I understand it, that's where the wires go into the back of your eyeball. You have no vi uh, visual receptors there. You can't see what's there. Now when you have both eyes open, the other eye catches it, so it's no problem. Right? But when you close one eye, there's actually a spot where you cannot physically see anything. Um, so basically it's called the lacuna, I think. Um, you just can't see the cross. Okay. You can see what's coming next. Please flip the card over to the side with the line. It looks like that. Again, put the, put the dot on the left. Hold it about 30 centimeters in front of your nose. Close your left eye. Stare at the dot with your right eye. And move the card in and out until you find that spot again. In and out. Inward and outward. You find that same spot. You're staring with your right eye. What happens this time? What happens this time? The line stays. So in other words, the little vertical thing goes away. The cross, part of the cross disappears, but the horizontal line stays, right? We don't see the cross, but we see the line. Wow, that's weird. What's happening? What's happening here? Your brain's what? It's definitely your brain doing something. Your, your brain's filling in the rest of the picture. Fascinating. So what's interesting about this is that the brain is not saying, hey, uh, I can't see what's there right now. There's a line on one side. There's a line on the other side. It may continue through there. It may not. I'm not sure. Please gather more information. Instead, the brain takes the bits of information that it gets from your receptors, your eyes and so forth, and it fills in the gaps, and it quickly fills in the line for you. So you can't actually see what they, what's there, but the brain is filling it in for you. And it's not telling you that it's doing that. It does it instantly and silently, right? So what's happening is the brain makes assumptions, creates feelings of certainty based on the bits of information it, information it receives. Uh, in the Toyota Kata world, we use this, this, this phrase you see on the screen, uh, current knowledge threshold, and the brain jumps right over that, fills in the blanks based on the information it has. So we don't know, notice a knowledge threshold, and that's kind of where the trouble starts. Our brain is a jump to conclusions mechanism. Now that sounds pretty negative, right? But the fact is, we need that assumption mechanism to get through the day. In fact, it's probably that assumption mechanism that got us to where we are today, right? Our survival depends on it. So imagine, you know, you're in a smoke-filled room and you can't quite see the exit sign. You can only see a little bit of it and your brain fills in the rest for you and you know where the exit is. It's very handy. Or scientists theorize that the genes we got are not from the prehistoric humans who said, Gosh, there's a rustling in the bushes there. I wonder what that is. Let me go check it out. Right? We didn't get those genes. We got the genes from the ones who quickly said, oh, that's got to be something bad. I'm out of here, right? who, who jumped to conclusions. So, uh, or look at the bike rider. You know, imagine your brain saying, you know, that car could be coming into your lane. I'm really not sure yet. I need more data. Hold on. Just keep riding. Don't worry about it. Right? <laughs> so it's, it's a mechanism that, that is better safe than sorry. It's better safe than sorry cognitive mechanism. It's also fast. It saves our very limited cognitive resources. Our conscious cognitive resources are, are very uh, limited. So it's beneficial when fast reaction is more valuable than deep understanding. We need that protective jump to conclusions mechanism. And it's automatic, and we all have it. OK, so, but it causes some problems. What do you see in this photo? found this on the web about a year ago. It was really kind of intriguing. What do you see? A pair of legs. Yes, what about the legs? They're oily or shiny or something, right? 
Okay, so the fact is, this young woman was painting something white and looked at her legs and said, oh my God, they look shiny. There is no shininess on these legs. There's just a little white paint on them and that makes them, our brain assumes that they're shiny, right? So the brain has just filled in the blanks for you. In this case, our little jump to conclusions mechanism made a mistake. So uh, our judgments are not always correct. We feel certain and then we make faulty decisions, just like Percival Lowell. And I gotta tell you, between the time that I show you guys the Percival Lowell story and we're all laughing at him, until I get to this slide and I give him a little relief, I feel guilty. I do, I do. He made an honest error. He kind of ran with it a little longer than he probably should have. There may have been some tests you could conduct in the academic world. Anyone from the academic world? They didn't have peer review, apparently. Could you look through this telescope and tell me what you see? You know, I didn't do that, so. What did we start with? Don't believe everything you think, right? So here it is. We, we, uh, we uh, make mistakes just like Percival Lowell. So a countermeasure to this natural and useful but somewhat dangerous jump to conclusions mechanism we have is scientific thinking. Now that sounds complicated. I think it's pretty simple. I like to say a routine of intentional coordination between what we think will happen next, seeing what actually happens, and adjusting based on what we learn from the difference. In other words, you make a prediction, you have an expectation, reality happens. If it's different from what you expect, which it often is, you're gonna learn something and that helps you move toward your goal. It's just that simple. And I think this diagram summarizes scientific thinking really well. It, it's just that easy. Um, scientific thinking is not difficult. It's not our default mode. That's the problem. It's not reserved for scientists, but it's just harder for humans to do because that's not our natural way of going. And that's what the improvement kind of, uh, pattern is about. Basically, we've got this threshold of knowledge, and you're going to experiment your way toward the goal and see further. So everybody's talking about using uh, human capability. It's a big topic right now. It sounds nice, but there's, it's, it's not so easy. There's more to it than just saying, hey, let's you, remember the 90s? You're a self-directed work team. How did that go? Hmm, we backed off that one pretty quickly, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. Because um, there was something missing. So we've all been in the meetings where uh, a problem or a goal is put on the table. And my job is to be in these meetings, kind of sit in the back and pay attention and see what's happening. And what often happens is immediately people start throwing out solutions to the problem. It's actually kind of uncomfortable to have, all of a sudden you're put into uncertainty. We need to get to this goal. We have this problem. Now we're in the gray zone. We're in an uncertain world. So we really would like to get that solved and get there as quickly as possible and get back to a, a sense of uh, security. So you're in this meeting. Everybody's throwing out ideas about what to do, right? You've got an idea. You've got an idea. I've got an idea. We're arguing for our solution. Who wins that argument? Maybe the loudest, the highest paid, uh, the most fearful person in the room? I don't know. So, okay, so now we're going to go out and we're going to do, we're gonna do uh, Dave's, Dave's solution, right? And we go out to the shop floor. Now, nothing works right the first time, right? So we go out to the floor, and as soon as that idea doesn't work very well, the rest of the team stand there like this because they had other ideas, right? What, what do we say? My stupid idea. I told you that wouldn't work. Let's go back and figure out something. So, this common mode of operation is not a good way of using our amazing brain power. The brain power is there. It is truly phenomenal, but it's latent. You have to mobilize it. You have to develop it. You have to mobilize it. You have to channel it. That's the job of the manager, right? Otherwise, we're going to jump to conclusions. So um, ar don't argue about the best solution. Argue about the best next experiment. Teams can fight, that's perfectly fine. Let's fight about what the next experiment is. The only way to get new information into the room is to try something. Someone said it to me yesterday, everybody in that meeting is just breathing their own exhaust. I thought that was a, a pretty good way to say it. So here's another trick. And again, the managers have to bring this capability out. It's, you know, a lot of times you hear about develop capability or, or use the people's capability, get out of the way. It's not that simple. You have, to, you have to kind of make it happen. So you're going out to do an experiment with your team, right? And just before you do the experiment, you turn back to your team and you look them in the eye and you say, why are we doing this? Why are we running this experiment? And invariably, someone on the team will say, uh, to see if this works, to see if the idea works. 
And then you, as the coach, as the teacher, as the manager, as the supervisor, look at your team and say, oh, we already know it probably won't work. You know, very few things work the first time out. You know? And your team's going to go, why are we doing this? You say, we're doing this to learn what we need to do to make it work. We're doing this to learn what we need to do to get to our objective. And what I need you guys to do when we go out there and run this experiment is not look at, oh, oh it failed. Isn't that weird? But look at what might we need to do? What might we need to adjust to make this work? And now you've switched on the brains in your team. Now you're using the brains in your team. But it had to be switched on. Empty autonomy, empty empowerment, your self-directed work team, I think, doesn't work. Um, OK, so there's this model. It's just a model. There are many models. How do you acquire this way of thinking? Right? We have lots of models. The business world doesn't, doesn't uh, want for models. The issue is not what is the model. The issue is how do you transition you and your team to what the model depicts? That's the hard work. That's the interesting work. And it's kind of funny, which is why I'm not a full academic. Um, we were talking about that yesterday, Ray, I, I, you know, ex-academic. Because in the academic world, when you publish a model, you're done. And then you go, I don't know why people aren't doing it. I, I published the model. It's strange. People aren't working that way. Uh, and the neuroscientists were, would say, well, you're just at step number one, right? Now you know what behavior and, and thinking you want. How do you actually transition to it? Here's the rub. Scientific thinking is not our default mode as adults. It's something we learn through practice. It is not our natural mode of operating. It is as children, very small children, I think. But we quickly lose that because we acquire a library of neural experiences that gets us through life what we see the world through those, those uh, neural experiences then. So we have to learn it through practice. How do you do that? What you can do is you can combine a scientific thinking pattern like the improvement kata with techniques of deliberate practice, just like in sports and music. And this is fascinating. In sports and music, practice is commonplace. Nobody would assume that you're going to learn how to play a musical instrument without practice. Nobody would assume that you're going to learn a particular sport without some practice and some starter practice. Yet in business, when you get into a company, they say, yeah, go. You'll learn the job on the job. There's, there's no practice involved, really, no deliberate practice involved. It's fascinating. Let's talk a little bit about deliberate practice. Uh, what does it take to learn new skills and to change our thinking? Take a moment, please, and fold your arms. All right. Now fold them the other way. You can see it coming, right? On the other way. All right. The question for you is, how did it feel the second time compared to the first time? Give me some words. Awkward. Unnatural. Thank you. What was that? Any more words? What, how does it feel the second time compared to the first? Forced. All right. Uncomfortable. OK, good. So here are some words from past groups. Awkward, slow, unnatural, stiff, uncomfortable, uh, difficult, it feels wrong. I like the last one. I had to think about it, right? So what's going on? Why does it feel so strange? And by the way, we're talking about a very minor change. We're not talking about culture modification. We are talking about folding your arms differently. <laughs> Already we're having trouble. All right, so what's going on? What's happening? Why does it feel so funny? Habit. We're not used to it, right? OK. So the fact is, you've been practicing folding your arms a certain way your entire lifetime. Our thinking patterns are in kind of a perpetual loop. What scientists like to say, which is at the bottom of this slide, is every time you think or do something, you're more likely to do it again. So every time you fold your arms a certain way, you're actually laying down a little bit of pavement, a little bit of neural pathway in your brain. Every time you do that, and you can see the highway in the picture, you fold your arms often enough, you've created a super highway for how to fold your arms. So every time you fold your arms, you're laying down a little track, and that track means that the next time you fold your arms, you're going to probably fold it that way again, right? So we're trapped. Our habits just perpetuate and, and, and solidify themselves over and over again, right? Um, looks kind of like this, why the second time feels different. The brain loves these practice neural pathways. We have very limited cognitive capacity in the conscious brain, right? So we have these fast and efficient neural pathways, which, like you said, are habits. 
They look like these superhighways. That's crossing our arms the usual way, requires little attention and energy. Your brain doesn't want to think about folding your arms. Imagine you're in a conversation you know, at a party, and it's like, could we stop talking for a minute because I have to fold my arms? You know? <laughs> or you know, you're driving a car or any number of things, you have to actually stop and think about doing some mundane thing that's automatic. The brain doesn't want to do that. It's better safe than sorry and so forth. Um, and on the right-hand side is folding your arms. The other way, that's a, that's a wooded path that you have to machete your way through. Uh, doing something new or different requires attention and energy at first. So the new ways on the right-hand side, that, that woodland path, those are the words you used, awkward and, and, and so forth and so on. You know what's funny about those words? What were they awkward, slow, unnatural, stiff, uncomfortable, difficult, it feels wrong, I had to think about it, or I don't want to? Right? Those are the exact same words you hear when you initiate change in your organization. If you're trying to do a one-piece flow cell, uh, change anything you do, those are the exact same words you hear here. We'll come back to that in a moment. Um, so there's a lesson in here. Don't fight existing neural highways. People have habits. You can't fight those habits. So here's someone up there. That could be me giving a presentation, here's what Toyota does, let's do what Toyota does, right? Just explaining a different way usually doesn't work. The learner will almost always stick with or revert back to their established habits. And what's interesting about that, or what's good for you to know about that, is that they're not doing it because they're hostile. It's a physiological thing. Here's what can work. You deliberately practice a different routine, and over time that creates a new neural pathway uh, that takes the place of the old one. What if you practice folding your arm the other way for a month, every day a little bit, 20 minutes a day? What would happen? You'd get it, right? Uh, there, you can try it at home. Uh, try it with brushing your teeth. You will have bloody gums the first day. Don't blame me. Um, yeah, you just uh, uh, practice a different way. And it creates a new neural path. So we have a short two-minute video that really explains this better than, than anything I've seen. And this is available on the Toyota Kata YouTube channel. Could we see the first video, please? Not so long ago, many scientists believed that the brain did not change after childhood, that it was hardwired and fixed by the time we became adults. But recent advances in only the last decade now tell us that this is simply not true. The brain can and does change throughout our lives. It is adaptable, like plastic. Hence, neuroscientists call this neuroplasticity. How does neuroplasticity work? If you think of your brain as a dynamic, connected power grid, there are billions of pathways or roads lighting up every time you think, feel, or do something. Some of these roads are well-traveled. These are our habits, our established ways of thinking, feeling, and doing. Every time we think in a certain way, practice a particular task, or feel a specific emotion, we strengthen this road it becomes easier for our brains to travel this pathway. Say we think about something differently, learn a new task or choose a different emotion. We start carving out a new road. If we keep traveling that road, our brains begin to use this pathway more and this new way of thinking, feeling or doing becomes second nature. The old pathway gets used less and less and weakens. This process of rewiring your brain by forming new connections and weakening old ones is neuroplasticity in action. The good news is that we all have the ability to learn and change by rewiring our brains. If you have ever changed a bad habit or thought about something differently, you have carved a new pathway in your brain and experienced neuroplasticity firsthand. With repeated and directed attention towards your desired change, you can rewire your brain. So this is where kata come in, or as I like to call them, starter kata. We started by calling, nine years ago, 10 years ago, we called it kata, but now we're calling it starter kata because people misinterpreted it, and it's our fault. You know, we, it, the lean community is used to implementing things. So we put something out called kata, and people implement kata. And you come back two years later, and they're still doing the exact same pattern, right? 
So we changed it to starter kata a couple of years ago to make it clear that these are routines you do at the start. These are things you do like in music, play some scales, those things you do at the beginning to learn the fundamentals of some pattern, get some basic pattern, and then you can build on that, right? So here it is. There's that perpetual loop like folding our arms. You know, every time you do something, you're more likely to do it again. With kata, with starter kata, you're able to inject a slightly different way of doing things and get on a path to developing that yellow line in the video, a slightly different neural pathway. That's essentially what you're doing. There's culture modification made real. There's also a coaching kata because coaching is also a skill that needs to be learned. So we have some beginner or starter practice routines for the coach, right? Um, and really, again, in sports and music, it's nothing unusual. It's just unusual in business. It's just a starting point, a basic repertoire for the improvement kata, uh, the fundamentals, building block practice routines that help you learn this scientific thinking pattern and then adopt these ways of thinking and acting. And you can build on that any way you want. Look at the guitar chord thing. You know, does a, does, does a rock and roll star use those anymore? Probably not. The funny thing is everybody wants to play Stairway to Heaven right away. They don't want to play their scales, right? But you got to get through there. Jazz musicians are a great example. I didn't know this about jazz musicians. They practice all these fundamentals so that when they're on stage together, they don't have to think about those. They can weave in, oh, you're going that way. I can go that way with you because I've practiced those routines. Um, no, look at the dance steps. I think that's a good one. Um, does a dancer who's accomplished paint steps on the floor and follow them? No, they have their own style, right? But they started with the steps. Why did they start with the painted steps on the floor? What did the painted steps on the floor do for them? Gets the basic pattern in your head and makes it automatic so you don't have to think about that and then you can concentrate on building on that and developing your own style. It's not a problem solving method. If you do A3, whatever problem solving you use, you can use the starter kata, you'll get better at what you're already doing. I'm not keen to put a new problem-solving method into the world and say those ones before were no good, but this one is good. That never ends. This is a way of getting better at whatever improvement and problem-solving methodology you use. And starter kata are particularly useful if you're trying to create a shared culture in a team because everybody starts with the same basics. Okay, so um, this is a little four-minute video by BJ Fogg, and we have time for it. Um, it's also on the Toyota Kata YouTube channel. And basically what BJ is talking about here is using starter kata to develop new skills, habits, and mindset. Could we watch the second video, please? I would have never expected that a year ago, that today I would be doing 50, 60, 70 push-ups a day. But all this is part of being obsessed with the behavior. And one of the things that you need to do if you, is practice changing your own behavior. And that gives you an understanding of how behavior works. Now, the way I arrived here was very much like the flossing, but a little bit different. And this was the equation. After I pee, I will do two push-ups. <laughs> OK, so I'd use the facility. Yes, technically, you flush the toilet first, and then Two push-ups, and you're done, and you go, awesome, okay? <laughs> That's, yeah, okay, awesome, yeah. Well, after two, it's really easy. You move on, then you do five, then you do eight, and it, the current, where I'm at now, I do eight, but I always do extra credit, so I tend to do 12 or so, and it adds up over the day. I end up doing, who knows, 50, 60, 70, depending on how much water I've had and other factors. <laughs> the good news is that behavior and behavior change is not as complicated as most people think. It's systematic. And One of the best ways to get people to do a behavior in the long term is to build their confidence and ability through baby steps. Now, I know you've heard the term baby steps before, and sometimes people trivialize that because it's like baby steps. It sounds trivial, but it's not. Baby steps are super powerful. It's a way to help people continue to do harder and harder behaviors. And the way it works is this. If you start people out doing something easy, 
And if they feel successful doing that thing, they're much more likely to do it again because that thing becomes easier to do. That behavior, let's say it's walking five minutes, it's easier to do day two. And naturally their motivation rises up. They're more hopeful and less fearful around that behavior. So as you have them take baby steps, you're letting them develop more ability and more motivation. And so you can ratchet up the baby steps and ask them then to do something harder. Maybe walk 15 minutes, day one, day two, day three. And now here comes the magic. Not necessarily after day three, but after a period of time of feeling successful. What I call success momentum. There's this moment in time that I call a springboard moment where they jump up and they're, they're able to do something much harder. What seems to happen is their fear shifts to hope. So fear depressing the behavior, as they feel successful, then they become more hopeful than fearful. And notice as the motivation goes up, they're able to do a hard behavior. And I found that people actually select the hard behavior on their own, and they do this without me prompting them. The key is to help them take baby steps, guide them on the baby steps, and help them feel successful. That's how you tap into the power of success momentum and you lead them to what I call a springboard moment. And boom, they'll do these harder things. I have people every week who email me and say, BJ, thank you, helping me succeed in these small ways. I, wow, I, I, I was feeling so awesome about what I was doing and my ability to change. I did this super hard thing in my life. So watch for that in your own life and watch for that dynamic in the lives of people you work with. So one thing about this, uh, it turns out it's daily practice. The, the neuroscience is really clear. If you practice 20 minutes a day, that's much better than, better than two hours once a week. This is kind of an interesting little diagram. If you look at those little lines, and if those are days of the work week, and the red marks are when you practice something new and the rest of the time it's business as usual, a neuroscientist would look at that and say, please don't fool yourself. What you're practicing is business as usual, not the new thing. The new thing is not what you're learning. It's also, at the beginning especially, it's practice with coaching. Because when you first practice, what are you going to practice? New habits or your old habits? What are you going to tend to practice? Old habits. So it's frequent practice, a little bit every day, uh, with some coaching input, especially at the beginning. OK, let's see. We've got a company of hundreds, if not thousands, of people. These people should practice every day, a little bit. And they're going to need some coaching input, especially at the beginning, so they don't practice the wrong things and develop the wrong habits. Practice makes permanent, right? Oh, who can do that coaching? Not the lean team, right? The lean team can't be everywhere. There's only one person in the company who can do that, and that's the supervisor or manager. They become the coach. And moving it into the line functions, not the staff functions. Here's another uh, Homer Simpson dope slap moment for me. Remember those words? Awkward, slow, unnatural, when you folded your arms the other way. And those are the very same words you hear with any change effort. Those are the words you want to hear. Those are exactly the words you want to hear. Because if you don't hear those words, it means you're not learning something new. Those indicate you're learning something new. Here is uh, a learner. And those are some various starter kata that a learner is using. Uh, and on the left is the coach. The coach is using a starter kata. These are just the headings for something we call a coaching cycle, just the basic pattern or structure that that coach is trying to learn. And then here's that very same coach starting to develop her own style. So she takes on the left side of this card that you can see are the five questions, the pattern that, of the starter kata. On the right-hand side are the questions and thoughts that she's starting to write in that she likes to do when she coaches. So she's taking that basic starter kata pattern, and as she starts to internalize it, and it becomes more automatic, and she doesn't have to think about it, she's starting to add in her own style. She's starting to play jazz. And that's exactly what's supposed to happen. We go beyond the starter kata. So the starter kata, in this diagram, you see they're just a starting point. They give you the fundamental patterns, and then you can build on that any way you like. And again, it's kind of advantageous in a team or a group or a company if everyone starts with the same basic starter patterns. You don't have to use ours. You can use different ones. But everybody starts with the same basic patterns. Then you're started to create a deliberate culture in that organization. So Toyota Kata is two things, a scientific improvement pattern and techniques of deliberate practice to make scientific thinking a skill that can be used by anyone. Uh, so summary, knowing ain't the same as doing. Just benchmarking what another organization is doing is not enough to make change happen. Not because people are hostile, it's physiological.
That's how the brain works. Number two, scientific thinking is a great way to navigate, but it's not our default mode as adults. And number three, skills, habits, and mindsets are wired in our brain. And number four, you can practice starter kata with a little coaching uh, to help wire your brain for scientific thinking. It is something just about anyone can learn. And finally, you can also modify an organization's culture this way with managers as a coaches. What can you do next? Get yourself a five-question card and an improvement kata poster and start messing around with it. Take it to a meeting and ask those questions. You'll be surprised. All of those things are available on the Toyota Kata website. The stuff there is free. You can print out the cards yourself, or you can buy them if you want. I don't sell them, but there are print shops that sell them. Um, you'll also find links to the videos, uh, other materials. We have the Toyota Kata books. If you want to practice, maybe the Toyota Kata practice guide. If you're going to buy one of these, that's probably uh, the best one to buy. The Toyota Kata book on the left is the original research report, which is very popular. And the Toyota Kata culture book on the right is more about how do you spread it up and down an organization. It's more of the Hoshin thing. Um, do the improvement Kata exercise. We're going to do this today at 10.30 and 2.30 if you have time to join us. This is a one-hour exercise being used in classrooms and companies around the world. It's very easy to run, and all the materials uh, are available for free. Uh, and finally, there are also, I was surprised, Kata presentations here. Yesterday, Price, the Price people here. Yeah, thank you very much. Oh, wow. Thank you very much for presenting yesterday. Uh, Price is dabbling with improvement kata, coaching kata. And uh, Baptist M Memorial, Skip uh, Stewart, is here. And he's going to present at 9.15 what they're doing. And tomorrow, Betty and Jay, are you here? I saw you guys. There you are. Betty and Jay from Zingerman's are going to present uh, what they're doing with kata at 10.45 tomorrow. And this is Zingerman's sticker. Uh, Zingerman's comes up with its own phrase, and they said, release the kata, right? So that's kind of what we'd like to end with, release the kata. Let us know how it's going for you. Mike, thank you thank very you. much. That's amazing. Oh. Little token of our appreciation. Thanks. That's thank very nice. Thank you very much.